Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. Episode 43, Māori Music with James Holt, Part Tahi. That's one. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons, such as Neville, Adam and Trot. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we finished off our chat on Taonga Puoro with the realm of Hineru Katori, goddess of flutes, specifically Nuru, Pukaya, and the Putorino. Well, we aren't quite done yet. This episode, and the next one, I talk to James Holt, who is someone that has much more knowledge of Māori music than I do. In fact, he studied the topic to earn a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and a Bachelor of Arts with Honours in Anthropology, specialising in Ethnomusicology. Primarily, we talk about more modern Māori music, so that of the last hundred years or so, rather than Taonga Puoro. We actually talked for about six hours or so, just having a good chat before and after we recorded this, so the interview, if you can even call it that, is a bit more conversational and casual. It should go without saying that because of this, there is the odd bit of swearing and the occasional F-bomb. It's not a lot, but it is in there, so you have been pre-warned. I'd also like to apologise for any audio muck-ups. This is the first time I'm using my portable setup, so I'm still learning that part. Anyway, thank you to James for coming on, and I hope you all enjoy and learn something new. As I said, starting it off is the weird bit. Yeah. Maybe maybe I should just leave this in. Yeah, do it. Maybe I should just leave... That's pretty much what I've done in the past. Yeah. Shall we just just mention that we've tried for about two hours to get this? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, kia ora James, kia ora. Thank, you, thank you for, for joining me, we've, sure. uh, we've actually, um, it's, uh, what is it, it's about quarter past four on a Saturday right now, and we got here at two o'clock, yeah, yeah, we've been trying to start this episode for a good, uh, two-ish hours, um, but we've just really just been having a good chin wag, actually, uh, uh yeah, Bob Simple came up, Bob Simple came up, so, you know, we, we had to spend a so good, that was a good, good hour, a good while on that, yeah, um, but yes, no, um, we, I've, I've got someone else on, which is quite exciting. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, pretty much the, the first actual interview yes. I've done. And the first Māori on the podcast, right? Uh, yeah, pretty sure, actually. Yes, I'm hitting yeah. so many firsts. So many today. firsts. <laughs> yeah, no, so you should feel honoured. I am. <laughs> I feel deeply honoured. Deeply honoured. Yeah. No, so, yeah, so we've got um, we've got someone else on the podcast, because they actually know more than me about something. Uh, let's, um, pre- let's not preface that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe cut that bit out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but James has actually done stuff. Yes, um, you yes, have I done have. stuff instead of stuff. Um, me, but like me, where I've just bought books off Trade Me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the stuff I yeah, did, but yeah. mine was for a grade at the end. Of yes, it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, do you do you want to tell us or tell the viewers, look, viewers? I don't know viewers. why I keep saying viewers. viewers the listeners. They're not viewing anything. The, the beautiful listeners. The beautiful this podcast. Li- The beautiful listeners of of. We should also probably preface. Oh, you are one of them. That, yes, I am one of them. That yes. is how yeah. this is how we yeah. connect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, um, indeed, indeed. Because he he had said that he was going to be doing um, episodes on music, and I was like, oh, like if you need any help, I just said if you need any help, I can give you some information. And he hits me back with, oh, oh we can interview you, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> but here I am. <laughs> yeah. So um, we actually we connected towards the end of last year in 2019 yes we did to which i told you um i'm very far behind and not gonna hit that for a while and i was and i yeah <laughs> and i and i kind of sat back and was like oh yeah no that's fine just like message me whenever kind of forgot about it and then you met yeah i think you mess- i've had that message sitting in my inbox for a while yeah. to remind me that i needed to <laughs> and message then I think, you i'm not sure if i messaged you or you messaged me i think i messaged you because i made this plan that i was like yeah we're gonna do music now oh yes and that's when I was like, okay, well, I better, I better message him. Yeah. Um, so and that's when I, I hit you up and was like, hey, we should do the thing. And we we're like, yeah, cool. Um, and and then COVID hit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we were gonna kind of do it, and we we hadn't quite set the date, but no. we were like, yeah, okay, cool. You know, we, we're pretty much there. 
And then, um, yeah, everything kind of went to shit. But in, but in, <laughs> but in all of this time, at the beginning of, at the end of last year, I was living in Auckland, and now I have moved down to Wellington. So this means I can do an in-person interview. Yes, this was part of the reason, kind of, why we delayed it. Yeah. Was because it was like, yeah, we could do it over over Skype or whatever, but if we could do it in person, that would be quite cool. And I was planning just to come down for like a, a weekend, but apparently now I'm I'm here for life now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so. I've, I've kept him here. I've yeah, him here. I'm, yeah. No. <laughs> this so, was uh, actually my new job, guys. Hi. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I've got a new co-presenter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> God. Um, so yes, yeah, so James has done some some stuff. Yes. Um, so do you want to tell us, I guess, a bit about yourself, what that stuff is? Yes. And I guess generally why I bothered to invite you at all. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. So here I am justifying my presence. Um, so I did my research in ethnomusicology, which is the a subsection of anthropology, which is the study of cultural music. And my dissertation was on the application, well, the progression of pre-Māori music, uh, pre-Māori music, pre-colonial Māori music, and then its kind of transmutation into contemporary Māori musical expression today. And so I did a lot on historical Māori music, so Tonga Puhoro is one, Haka is another, um, which is probably the oldest form of Māori music that's still existing today. Um, and then kind of transition that all through to um, kind of waiata and kapahaka, well into um, kind of reggae, which is a big a big subsection of Māori music, and into, you know, the Stan Walkers and the Tikitanes and the, uh, what's the, and um, Alien Weaponry, which is the... Um, <laughs> heavy metal band. yes i had someone hit me up on twitter about yes. uh, alien weaponry the other day yeah. and they they said they were um very interested and were listening to that i think they said their kid actually introduced them really uh, to the yeah which was uh, quite interesting yeah i mean so, yeah i mean and on, a, on a slight tangent on alien weaponry i mean i think that was that was one that kind of surprised me um, because it was, it's they're using quite an ancient form of Māori musical expression, which is haka, and adding it to heavy metal, which is kind of like electron, electronic it's, instruments. It's, it's a, I guess, a fusion of kind of a little bit old, a little bit new. Well, type stuff. and but it, it it works so seamlessly mm. in ways that I probably, if you had told me, like, oh, what would you think about heavy metal Māori music? I'd say, I think that sounds like a fucking horrible idea. <laughs> um, and then I heard, like, Alien Weaponry with Kai Tangata, and I was like, this is seamless. Yeah, like, yeah, this, yeah. I was like, this is a haka. It's a haka mm. with a bit of electronic music in the background, but it's a haka. It's got mm. everything that a haka requires. It's got a challenge. It's got, you know, the, the beat, the shouting, the kind of the, the, the guttural soul and wairua that you require in one. So, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, I was kind of floored by Alien Weaponry, and I'm kind of obsessed with them now. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so that was what I did, and so I w thought I would help in talking about yes. um, musical expression here in New Zealand, because of course, like, I didn't just cover Maori music; I also covered um, just general New Zealand uh, music and contemporary music here in New Zealand, and how those things kind of interacted um, with both. Um, pre-colonial Māori and also um, how that's kind of worked into the like 18, 1980s and 60s and 50s and all those places that we don't actually talk about in New Zealand because we think nothing happened in the 1950s and 60s but a hell of a lot a happened. A lot happened actually. In the 1950s We and will 60s. talk about that in 10 years time when I, yes. when I get up to it. And by, by 2060. 2060 we'll be year anniversary about. of the 1960s. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, there's yeah, there's a lot. A lot is good though. A yes. lot is good. More, it, more is better than less. I don't like it, it's um, like you see other other people they research things like um, you know, ancient Greece or or that, that kind of stuff. They got like three sources and that's it. Yeah, you know, I'm like, on the one hand that's good. You've only got three things that you have to read. On the other hand, it's really nice to have all these different. Yeah, uh, and I said, and, and all of the history has been real piecemeal. I found mm. that when I was doing my research in music, is that you you were kind of you were kind of using sources from like the 1800s with sources that you that someone yeah. wrote yesterday and you had to kind of almost piece together this like traction of history and almost read between the lines and i think yeah. that's a lot of new zealand history if i'm being honest yeah absolutely um so what i, I guess what is your experience personally with Māori styles of music um, mm. in terms of uh, did, did you grow up with it yes. or uh, I guess w what's your story behind why you were interested in it enough to, to go and actually study it yeah well actually this was really interesting because I found so when I was it was one of those things where uh, you know when you're like 
with friends and you kind of talk about like music that your parents listen to mm. and a lot of my friends are talking about music that I hadn't really come across and a lot of the music I had been listening to had weirdly enough been uh, if, if it wasn't like overtly Maori so like Prince Tui Teka for example was a big influence in my in my young days um Dennis Marsh I'm not sure if you know who he is no sorry <laughs> he had a song he had a song called um Maori Hangi I anybody listening I look it up it's a it's a cultural reset um but I, I've kind of realized that actually I was listening to music that was a little bit different from my peers. And so I wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit and be like, okay, so what are the, what are Māori listening to that Pākehā aren't listening to? And you had the obvious ones. So there's, you know, music that are sung by Māori in Māori. Uh, you know, you would imagine that Māori are listening to that music. But then I also had, you know, I'm um, Connie Francis huge influence in my life no one none of my friends their parents listened to connie francis and yet here i was in this rural maori town always listening to like stupid cupid and um everybody somebody's full um you i was and so it was it, that was kind of my first initial reason for doing it um and on top of that also there was songs that would sing on the marae that would do you know after someone does a fly or that you couldn't hear anywhere else um the kind of songs that i learnt. um just basically being on the marae or, or being with, around my family and kind of, you know, wondering, like, you know, how is it that we managed to, to keep those songs alive and, and where did those songs come from? Um, and, and why do we sing them? Mm. More importantly, like, why, why did these songs remain and the other songs that we sang long, long ago didn't? Um, and was that down solely to the pressures of colonialism or was there something a bit more deeper there so that was yeah there's, there's a lot of my my reasoning and so my a lot of my experience with Māori music was either on the marae um singing in support of anybody in the fai kōrero doing the fai kōrero i mean um or just kind of the ones that you'd i'd always call it the Māori garage party mm -hmm. so where you'd all kind of like you'd you'd all kind of clamber into a garage or some sort of like a shed of some description away from the main house everybody would have a box of beer and suddenly your uncle will pull out a guitar from nowhere out yeah. of thin air and suddenly you're singing um old war songs or old or like or just any kind of song connie francis stupid cupid's still coming up it's something that's very apparent in my life <laughs> um you know, you'd start singing these songs and everybody knew them. And when you're a young kid, you start to learn them just simply by being around it. And suddenly you're singing them and then you, and you realize that it's going to continue in this very organic way. So I essentially, it was just, I wanted to kind of dig, dig that a little bit deeper from my personal experience and kind of dig in and say, okay, well, what are other Maori experiencing? And uh, is is this a thing that all Māori are doing? But probably more importantly, is this something that other cultures are doing? Mm. So, um, in, when I was doing my research, I was doing a lot on, like, Afro-Cubanism and kind of the New Orleans kind of scene mm -hmm. of, of music and jazz. And so it kind of saying that, like, well, this is something that Māori are doing, but actually it's something that humans themselves do when, like, different musical styles kind of clash. You kind of try to bring in your cultural perspective into the sounds and kind of beats that you're into and that was really it um that was that, i say that, uh, that, that was, was it that was it <laughs> that was it <laughs> that was it my my 10 minute tirade that was all it was, <laughs> was, a, was a, just just like that just like that <laughs> you know just casual things <laughs> <laughs> casual thoughts and opinions absolutely so what about um, what about Tonga Pōro specifically? What kind of uh, experience had you had with that, either before you went to uni or during yeah. uni or after? What kind of experience in general do you have with, with them? So in terms of cultural practice, almost none. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I think that's down to the history of Tonga Pōro. It was very much stamped out during the colonial period. Um, and I think also what I found interesting when I was studying it was that it was it, because I think of this transition from kind of uh, traditional Māori beliefs into Christian beliefs, the same kinds of fear and unknown with Taonga Pūoro started coming up within Māori communities. Um, the fact that they had kind of, for, like, not necessarily forgotten, but the fact that they had, like, not really interacted with them in the same way that they had reacted, interacted with Christianity, those instruments kind of became almost tapu to the point that you never played them, uh, or because you didn't understand them, you didn't really engage with them. But what is interesting is that if I think about when I was growing up, 
and actually in, in a lot of Māori media, for example, or in a lot of shows that have Māori in it, you'll always hear, and I forget the name of it, <laughs> it's just terrible, um, but it's that, it's, it's, it's a, essentially a piece of wood that's been carved on a, on a string and a thread, and it's swung around the head, and it makes this whirling noise. Yeah, yeah, and you'll always hear it. And like, if if someone, if there's like a Maori on screen, and he's talking about like some curse or tapu that's mm-hmm. happening. You'll hear this little like woo yep. in the background. Um, so for just to interrupt you there briefly for listeners who are listening to this now, we've actually well, we're recording this a bit in advance of yeah. when this episode is going to come out. Obviously, that's how podcasts work. Um, but we're actually listening to this the week a few weeks after I have yeah. released the episode talking about that. Okay. Um, okay. So that quite, uh, if you remember back to that episode, I don't remember what the general name for it was. I'd have to look it up. But this was one that um, I made specific mention of the South Island name for it, which is, and I'm going to I'm gonna butcher this, but it was Ara? Ara. Something like that. It's, it's, it's apostrophe G-A-A-R-A. Oh yeah, Ara. Y- yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I, if you, if uh, listeners want to go to the website, um, to, uh, that episode, um, and under the Te Reo Māori in Hans section, I actually talk a little about my theory about why that is. Yeah. Um, about why the that apostrophe is there. Mm. I think it's dropping the N, but I'm not sure. Probably is. It's probably more like a Nga, but they've dropped yes. the N slightly to do like a G. Yeah. yeah, potentially because that is what Kaitahu yeah, do, I, right? Yeah, I, I, and, so, I, and as someone from the far north, I'm not going to comment on the Mita of Kaitahu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this is my, my theory uh, that, I, that I have, but that's, um, yes, we have spoken about yes. that. Yeah. Um, okay. Already. So yes. yeah. So those instruments you hear, um, and that was really down to a revival in the 1980s. And so um, I think for like any kind of Maori of my age, you're only really hearing it in like um, contexts of like you know Maori being, and a lot of the time in, in media, Maori are portrayed as these like spiritual guides for the the mis- the, the wayward European, and so they kind of talk about you know like the. They, they give you like a, a corridor on the curse or the tapu that is obviously going to be ignored by the Europeans and then the Europeans are all going to die or something or something terrible is going to happen, a volcano will explode and, um, and all of that. So you'd only really hear it then. But I think what was interesting is that when you start kind of digging deep into Tonga Puro, you come to understand that a lot of it was... A lot of the reason for using it, and this is probably where the, the, the tapu aspects came from when Māori converted was that a lot of the time you would do it because you were kind of lifting the veil so to speak between um the human world and this kind of spiritual world so the voice and the breath are very the breath is very sacred and so a a voice is very grounded someone talking and shouting and speaking is very human and it it, it does something to your wider but it's a very human kind of grounded aspect but blowing into an instrument Sorry, I've just yeah. interrupted James there because I don't know if we've addressed this word yet. Oh, okay. We might have, but wairua ah. is not a word I think we may have brought up. Right. So do you want to explain that Yes, one? so wairua is, on a basic principle, is your spirit. But, um, so there's... How deep do I go into it? Um, not too deep. No, not too deep. <laughs> not too deep. But there are essentially two parts to a human in, in Māori cosmology. There's your wairua, which is your spirit, or this kind of corporeal form and your tinana, which is just your body. And in between that is a connection called your modi, and modi is called your life force. And when this person dies, essentially the modi has severed, and your wairua goes off somewhere else, and the tinana remains in, in the earth. Um, and so when, I, when I'm talking about um, the voice hitting the wairua and, and attaching to the wairua, I'm saying that it does hit your spiritual realm, but it's still very much a human kind of a very like non tapu aspect um of your of yourself um however blowing into so a lot of the instruments for maori and tangapura were wood instruments and that was breath and breath is very much a spiritual corporeal um aspect of of maori cosmology at least from my area of the country um, so the breath is very sacred. Um, hongi, for example, I'm, we've, you've covered hongi. I'm you? pretty sure I have. Yeah. yeah. Hongi, for example, is it's the touching of noses, but the actual purpose of doing that is that you're meant to share breath with one another. Mm. And once you share breath, you've be, you 
you you've you've changed from being a guest or manuhiri and ahika or home people and now you're you're one because you've shared breath and now you're you're sharing the same space um and a lot of maori instruments were woodwind instruments they were uh, it required you to blow into them and a noise would come out and so a lot of that noise was associated with kind of a different a different realm um a lot of maori viewed those sounds as being the voices of the uh, of if not the gods of those that have passed of communing with people on, on the other side of the veil um and so yeah and and so part of it thinks part of me thinks that's why a lot of maori when they converted didn't really touch them anymore but also in saying that uh even though they had a spiritual purpose they were used for entertainment and i and i think we need to kind of move forward that they were only ever used for ceremony they were used for entertainment there's a lot of stories of people playing the the, the nose flute um there's a really my one of my favorite stories is the story of henimore and Tutanikai. have we covered have you covered that story? no i don't okay. think so go for it so henimore and Tutanikai. i won't go into too much detail because this will be a good story for him to actually do in the podcast um <laughs> But Henimon and Tutanikai are basically the Māori Romeo and Juliet. Um, Tutanikai was this uh, the son, the youngest son of a chief, and Henimon was the daughter of a rival chief. You know, Verona. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of Verona, it's uh, Rotorua. And the story goes that Henimon had kind of fallen in love with Tutanikai, and Tutanikai had fallen in love with her, but they couldn't be together because her father had forbidden it because he was of the rival um of a, of, a, of a rival group um but he went to mccoya island which is in the middle of uh i believe it's lake topo i might be wrong but he went to this island mccoya island in the middle of this lake and he was playing his nose flute he was practicing his nose flute and henny moore heard him and apparently he played so beautifully that she couldn't contain herself and she swam across the, uh, the the lake to the island um and they met together and they fell in love and they married and the rest is history but um what that story kind of pinpoints is that it was it was something that was used for entertainment but also like more importantly it was kind of used as a sense of attraction a man that could play like a courtship yeah, yeah like a man that could play an instrument was a man that you wanted to marry um and again another kind of layer that i like about that is that it's a man being pretty and doing something pretty that a woman will desire and that's mm. and that's something that kind of turns kind of the european ideas on courtship slightly on its head mm. um and also the the fact that she sat across a, a a lake to get to him is always i've always it's, if it's topo that's a big lake it's a, it's a big <laughs> lake it's a big lake and it's also a very cold lake <laughs> it is also a very cold lake so, yes. so she had to have been very much into the man very and motivated must, and he must have been very good at playing that nose flute for her to get yeah. across there so yeah so there is so there's kind of this grounded aspect but there's also the the fact that it was breath meant that there was a, a an extra cultural layer on on instruments that you didn't really kind of that that you had to kind of acknowledge and, and keep protected and keep yourself safe from yeah so again we have covered that a little bit mm. i should say I get, james is a listener of the podcast but he's not listened to the last uh few yeah uh, I've been very... so maybe if he did he would know we've covered this a maybe <laughs> but also i'm not sure if you've realized but the world's a bit of a crazy place right now it is <laughs> no so we and uh, so I, I, the only reason I say that is because we've, I, I classified it slightly differently yeah. in my episode where I made the distinction between, I, I guess I kind of classified it the same, but I made the distinction between the breath of, or the, the winds of a person versus the winds of, say, uh, Tafiri Ah, uh, yes, yes. Kind of, so the, the bull roar is classified as being under um tafiri mate's yeah. realm yeah uh whereas things like like the flutes are, are classed under something different yeah even though in the western sense they're both wind instruments they both use the ear mm. to make a noise yeah so a lot of so a lot of tonga puro that are considered sacred are in the realm of tane mahuta mm -hmm. um yep. and and uh, again tane mahuta's uh he's a, he's an interesting one he is obviously kind of the the apex kind of Atua in the sense that he was the one that separated his parents and he's the big boy <laughs> big boy separated his parents and um created te ao marama, the, the 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 kind of world of the living um but he is also interesting in the fact in the sense that he is also the progeniture of women mm -hmm. 
in particular and his essence his male essence and the essence of women is what created humanity um and so he's kind of he's this kind of almost catch-all god he's the god of the forests and birds but he's also the god the, the god of of man um Tumatoinga is also the god of man. Um, we had a slightly lot slightly confusing, slightly <laughs> confusing, but it all makes sense. They're different aspects of the same kind of um, yeah. yeah. So and and so his, he a lot of the things to do with Tane Mahutu are considered a lot more sacred than say Tafiri Matia, for example. Um, Tafiri Matia is viewed in a very different in, in a very different light, particularly because he was um, well, he's still having he's still fighting with his brothers now. Yes, he was very <laughs> famously vocally opposed to. Yeah. The and separation. if you've ever lived in Wellington or know about Wellington, you'll know Tafiri Matia's um, presence is very well known down yes, there. Yes, he's uh, very, very often felt, <laughs> even today. Even today, Just looking out the window now, it's um, uh, yeah, it's a bit grim. <laughs> I've got a I've got a clear view of your mirror, and it's not great. Yeah, <laughs> I have to go home. At some point, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess go, moving moving from the kind of more uh, I guess the, the the past stuff, yes, or the very the very the very old stuff to the more <laughs> modernish stuff. Ooh. Um, so I guess what aspects of Māori music, um, kind of what aspects are there that kind of set it apart from from other genres, or in other words, what does a, a Māori perspective or te ao Māori kind of add to other genres Mm -hmm. like i guess what yeah well that i mean that was basically my dissertation it was trying to (laughs) it was trying to ascertain (laughs) what is it like what like what what is it about maori music that makes it different and um i think looking through the lens of reggae is a very good is a very good way to um to look at it because um reggae obviously has its origins in um, Ethiopia and in kind of the, the, the Jah kind of Rastafarian um, sect of Christianity and it's obviously for that reason has been very very popular in Africa and very very popular in um, the Caribbean as well we can't obviously let's not ignore some of the great uh, reggae artists like Bob Marley who hail from Jamaica I was gonna say he's like the reggae artist, he, he is right? the like reggae if, artist, if anyone's yeah. gonna name a reggae artist it's yeah. gonna be Bob Marley. um but one of the things that's very common amongst reggae and where reggae is popular is that reggae is popular amongst either diasporic or homegrown african communities so africa of course reggae is big in Car- the caribbean which has large populations of afro um like afro-caribbeans it's very very big the difference is that reggae in New Zealand is huge and we don't have the same kind of African background for our reggae music. It comes from a Maori Polynesian background. Um, so that was interesting. And then I looked at like, okay, so what are some of the reasons why? And a lot of the reasons why is because uh, reggae talks about kind of, um, it, it, it talks about a history of greatness and then losing that greatness and struggling through that, kind of the, the 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 new reality that you're that you're dealt with so bob marley's music a lot of the time was talking about being taken away from your home country and being being a slave and then overcoming that that slavery and and, and rediscovering your kind of your power and your um and and kind of your your importance in the world and for maori that obviously did tra- translate quite well because in um here in new zealand Māori kind of lost the power to kind of dictate their own destiny and they kind of struggled through it and reggae really got popular in the 1980s and 1970s which is arguably the moments where Māori were really kind of trying to work through um the the issues that they had been facing for hundreds of years and they... and for for context on that the 1970s is when the Waitangi Tribunal was yes. set up so yeah. that is that kind of makes sense in the in the sense that that's roughly when uh, the New Zealand government acknowledged yeah. there was some stuff and that it, we probably shouldn't have been and, doing. And again, I don't want to get too much into this because because <laughs> it, it will be covered, but it does come at the tail end of the 1950s of what's known as the Māori Renaissance. So um, again, you'll all hear about this and it'll be fabulous when we get there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the so but the the kind of main characteristics of of, of reggae music and and Māori dim was you know you kind of it, it 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 hit in this in the same kind of way that it, it talked about you know um ancestry and it was very grounded in land and it was very grounded in like where you came from and 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 trying to rediscover yourself and it kind of really it 
it it lined up quite well and the the, the characteristics of of maori reggae is that it it kind of took it, it took in kind of aspects that weren't necessarily African. So there's the steel drum, for example, that comes from the Caribbean. But you started kind of adding in like the steel string guitar, um, which is very which is very associated with Hawaii. Um, it started adding in, you know, like um, like Air Papa by Herbs. If, I'm not sure if you've ever heard it. Again, look that up. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's a reggae song. Um, in the way in it's composed, but it's also using a very old, old Māori song. E Papa was uh, a song from the Whanganui region. And um, I, I, again, this, the history of it is also very sketchy and vague, but one of the stories is, is that it was actually a song that was um, produced in the 19 uh, kind of 30s and 40s and the Māori tourist industry was starting to really take off. Um, and one of some of these shows that you can still actually see if you go to Rotorua are these um, tirako shows which is the uh, stick these stick games mm -hmm. and they compose their papa because apparently along the Whanganui River uh, Marae would have contests to see who could do the song and who could do the most elaborate tirako tricks and um, from those competitions you'd kind of pick out the best ones to go and do these like tourist um, ventures and so yeah it's taking like a song that has a a, 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 like a very old song that has a history and, and kind of translating it into reggae and the whole song e papa is is the song about um it's actually a sad song but you you do it in a way that's it's 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 done in a way that makes it sound jovial but actually the the song itself is actually um you know longing for a loved one and and crying about the fact that you can't see them but they do it in a very jovial way and i think that's kind of it, aspects of of Māori music making is 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 like that it's you know you kind of you almost cover up the the hurt with humor um i mean that's again that's not necessarily just a Māori thing but a lot of Māori music and humor and media is about like talking about very difficult subjects with a veil of of humor and mm. cheekiness um if only to make it more palatable to the Parker society but also it's, it's easier to deal with because again if you can't laugh you cry mm. <laughs> which is kind of a, a major principle so reggae is one the other one was i feel like i need to talk about whaley and reaping Reap here i really <laughs> it's do. great let's, i, I let's really do, do. so okay <laughs> alien weaponry kind of like my faves <laughs> um, <laughs> that one is 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 perfect so heavy metal is i mean there's a lot of different heavy metals i i don't want to say like in particular if you're a metal head don't worry i i know it's a lot more complex than just heavy metal <laughs> i get it there's a lot of different genres but heavy metal is a very like rebellious very kind of anti-establishment form of rock and roll and it's a very much about kind of like essentially screaming your guts out. So everything that you've got inside of you that you're frustrated with, whether it be society or just the way in which you interact with that society, you scream it out. Um, and it, it works so well with Haka. So, so well. <laughs> Again, as I said, I was floored um, by, the, by how well it worked with Haka. Um, but the, the particular difference, I would say, in terms of if there, is, if there ever became like a, like a Māori heavy metal... Um, Again, we've only got one band, but... It's a start. <laughs> it's a start. It's a start. <laughs> um, but, you know, Kaitangata was interesting because, yes, it was about the frustrations of of um, society, but it was also like a... It was a, it was a reclamation of history. Um, it was about kind of saying, you know, you know, this is who we are as Māori. It was establishing the cultural basis upon um, who Māori were, but in a way that was modern and forward thinking but still harkened back to this past of haka and haka are commonly referred to as war dancers but they do have a lot more perspective to them um you can have a haka when you're sad you can have a haka when you're angry you can have a haka when you're happy the the point is is that you're trying to dig deep within yourself and take the purity of what you're saying outward um, so if you're really, really happy, you're screaming about how happy you are. If you're really, really angry, you're screaming about how angry you are. And it's about taking that kind of deep-seated um, purity of your expression and, and letting it out there for everybody else to know. Um, and so with with the, with the Alien Weaponry, it was about taking kind of the like cultural essence of Māori and screaming it out to someone in a platform that was, to a lot of people, familiar. 
um, and wasn't necessarily, and I think also wasn't bogged down by the, 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 the problems of cultural authenticity. I think a lot of the time when you do haka, sometimes if the, if the subject matter falls out of range of what people think a haka should be, people start to kind of say, well, that wasn't really a haka. But because it was a heavy metal song, it isn't necessarily a haka, so you were able to kind of like push the boundaries of what was kind of being told um, in that in that music that you wouldn't be able to do in a traditional haka sense. Um, and so, yeah, there's another one. I always go on on tangents. Great. <laughs> no, that was great. No, it's... um. Yeah, no, Alien Weaponry has been been an interesting one for me because it's, again, as you say, it's not, I guess it's not something that when, yeah, when you, someone says, hey, we, we took Haku and we put it into a heavy metal song, on the face of it, that does not sound like it probably would work. Well, and also, I mean, uh, uh, from a culture perspective, you'd uh, my first thing would probably say, that doesn't sound Tika, that doesn't sound like, that doesn't sound correct at all. Mm. And then you hear it and you're like, there's no way this can't be correct. Mm. Um, if anything, like, it's it's so good. And if you haven't heard it, look up Kaitangata by Alien Weaponry. If you hear it and see it, you're like, oh, heavy metal was designed for Haka. Mm. Like, heavy metal was meant for Haka. Um, so... Yeah, I think those are always interesting aspects because I think it, it it's one of those things where nothing has been lost, but a lot of things have been gained. Mm. So there's nothing to make... So the, the, the haka aspects from it, have, nothing's been lost about the essence of a haka. Nothing's been lost about the essence of a heavy metal song. They've just gelled together so well that they've just created something new and exciting. And honestly, I hope, I hope Alien Weaponry continues to kind of make this kind of music because it's something that I think ethnomusicologists are going to be talking about for a long long time um in terms of how culture kind of mingles with um already existent modern forms of musical expression amazing <laughs> love it so uh so sort of as a prior reading to this you did send me your uh dissertation unfinished draft because <laughs> my real one i can't find yes. <laughs> um but something i found quite interesting in it was um you repeatedly referred to this thing that you call a quote-unquote maori spirit yes yeah so i guess i, I guess I, was, I wanted to ask it because you talked to that a bit as to kind of what that is i realized from actually reading it that is not a simple question no uh, <laughs> no but do you want to do you want to kind of boil it down into into yeah. something as so, to kind of what you're actually trying to mean there? in ten thousand words or less <laughs> um which is the size of my dissertation uh no so essentially i was trying to say okay well what is it about so what what parts of this music actually make it maori because you can't call Māori music a genre, because Māori are in multiple genres. You can't call Māori music uh, the language because there are Māori that are singing in English. So what is it essentially that's a, like that makes it um, Māori? And I used a report that was done by the Waitangi Tribunal, that's appearing again. Um, <laughs> it's, it's going to appear, it's a, going few to appear a few times. <laughs> there is a, a contemporary claim called Y262. And I won't go into detail about this claim because it's a very detailed and complex claim. However, the claim is essentially a cultural claim. It's a claim on, uh, it was called the flora and fauna claim. And then they kind of expanded it out and were like, okay, well actually what, what is this, um, what is this contemporary claim actually about? And essentially the, the conclusion was, is that, um, the claim is really a, 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 a an in-depth cultural claim, um, on what, and part of that kind of reporting that was done was they had to kind of like deduce okay so what is maori culture and what is pakia culture and um in in that they they kind of separated into two peoples they called it kupes people and cooks people and they talked about that maori culture was polynesian culture that came to new zealand interacted with that with new zealand's environment and became something distinct and they used the same thing for Cook's people, saying that um, the people that came with Cook, or more accurately, those that came from Britain, came from a cultural template in the British Isles, came to New Zealand, interacted with the environment of New Zealand, and became something distinct. That distinction, of course, they reiterated that um, for the British, it was a culture that is manifested via the interaction of the natural environment but also of the maori that were here so there was a there's a connection that pakia have to acknowledge that their culture is shaped just as much by maori culture as maori culture is shaped by 
Pākehā culture that was introduced. So, after that long-winded expression, I took what they dis- t- talked about, which was um, cultural taonga. So, these were distinctions within Māori culture that um, if something like if if if, if something kind of hit these parameters, it was considered Māori. Um, so, one of the things was is that if something has used the uses the Māori language, it's Māori because Māori language is intrinsically connected to the culture. So, I thought perfect. Um, every song that's in Te Reo Māori is a Māori song. Cool. Can label that. Easy. Easy. But what about, say, Stan Walker's song, uh, New Takeover, which is entirely in English, but the entire music video and the entire sentiment of that song is about um, pride in being Māori and pride in being Indigenous and and it was a, a showcase of Māori culture. Okay, so is that a Māori song, even though it's sung in English? Well... Um, a lot of them, so he, his, the music video he shot was a lot about the land. Um, the dancers, for example, would interact with the land quite, uh, like, quite a lot. Um, one dance move was women dipping their hair into the water and throwing the, um, the water up into the air and it falling down like rain. Um, and he also interacts a lot with, um, kind of cultural movement. So a lot of the dancing that he's doing is related to haka. A lot of the fashion that he wears in it is... Um, uses kind of traditional materials like flax. And in the Y262 report, you can say, oh, well, so um, anything that's kind of made with the kind of naturally occurring substances in New Zealand can be considered Māori culture. Flax. Um, easy. Easy. Done. <laughs> um, so, and, and so what I did was I took their kind of template for identifying taonga and I thought, well, can I apply that to music. So what is it in music that makes something Māori? And I used a very good example with kapahaka. The kapahaka nowadays would be considered traditional Māori expression. Um, but if you were to do a kapahaka performance in front of, say, Tamati Wakanini, who was uh, one of the tūpuna that signed the treaty, um, he would think, what the hell <laughs> is this? <laughs> crap um because a lot of that a lot of it apart from the haka a lot of what is in kapa haka is not traditional um but what makes so but what makes that expression maori again it's done in te reo maori so there we go you can put te reo maori on the list of what makes something a maori spirit um it uses traditional um tools so poi for example was something that was used in in, uh, in maori culture that's in kapa haka but the main one is that all the music in Kapahaka and all the music talks about issues to deal with Māori. They are Māori issues that are being talked about. So in Kapahaka, you'll always have a whakaeke, which is essentially a song or something where you... It's something... It, it, it's meant to be a challenge to do something about a problem. And so... A lot of the time, Fakeke, for example, in Timatatini, which is the big Kapahaga contest, they'll always call on the the crown to honour the treaty. That's that's a very uh, regular one. They might do one on a challenge of homelessness, uh, poverty, um, environmental degradation. But these are issues that are, but as, but you know, so honouring the treaty, for example, these are things that are very Maori focused. Maori are very keen to have the government honor the treaty and they're challenging the government and challenging all of new zealand to do the same in a way that is familiar to maori and um yeah and and deals with their issues another aspect of that was kind of it was basically saying so where where else do we see that um herbs is a perfect example on nuclear testing um again honoring the treaty um, if you ever heard the song Dragons and Demons, uh, which is, again, look that up. Um, the song is about, you know, uh, dragons and demons are in your head, nothing to fear. And they were talking about um, the police identifying Pacifica and Māori during the dawn raids, which again is going to be another lovely chestnut. Uh, again, these are, these are issues that Māori were inherently facing that Pākehā were not. Pākehā mm. were not being um, singled out in the dawn raids. They were not being sing- they were not being profiled by police. They were not being dragged off Bastion Point again. Another piece of history. Um, so they were, and so the song itself was in English. It was in reggae, but it was an issue that Maori were facing, and they wanted it to be known. Um, and so that was what Maori spirit was. But um, 
in my later version of the dissertation. Yes, I didn't see the yes. final version. <laughs> yeah. In the later version, I realized that actually this is something that any culture can do. Um, because again, what you're really saying is, um, what you're really kind of saying is that, okay, so it's a culture's issues being transplanted through music. And so what I'm, so what I, re- what I'm really saying Māori spirit is, is that Māori spirit is taking in those cultural perspectives and translating it through any way possible. Um, so, and, and translating it in a way or, or through music that is, um, ideally is relatable to Māori. So I gave reggae as an example, but it can really be through any way. I mean, Prince Tuiteka was kind of more of a lounge singer, kind of, um, uh, like rock and roll almost actually. You could, you could argue. I wouldn't say that really, but, um, he would talk about Māori. He, he would use Māori humour. Um, he'd, he'd take Pākehā songs, in fact. Um, I'm trying to remember the song. And I, I think it's the, the Green Green Grass of Home, or is it... Uh, one of these songs that's done by, I think it's Engelbert Humperdinck. It's just such a name. <laughs> um, but he, you know, one of the one of the lines is like, in the, in the English version, like, there was Mary, um, golden hair and lips of cherry. And in, <laughs> in his version, he goes, um, there was Mary... Um, hair of gold and lips so hairy and it's kind of he's and he's and he's really trying to he's just kind of talking about like kind of rural Māori life you know you've got you, you got your cousin Betty almost attractive not not exactly a blushing blossoming flower but she's you know she's got kind of she's she's always there and she's she's like kind of a cultural staple and it was kind of talking about these like rural Māori realities within songs and kind of almost distorting European songs kind of taking the European song and having it almost exactly the same but changing a lyric here or there mm. to make it more relatable and funny to Māori and in his, a lot of his shows he would um he would say a phrase in Māori and um and then you know all these Māori's in the audience were laughing and a lot of Pākehās were like what? And then he'd go, I'm sorry, Parky, I was like, can't translate that. And really, it's because it's very rude. Um, <laughs> one, one was, and I can't remember the Māori phrase, but in, in English, he says, um, there's these two ladies at the front of the audience, and he says, oh, um, do you like the drummer? Because he had a new, younger-looking drummer. And he says, be careful of that drummer, because he likes hairy vagina. <laughs> and he said that in Te Reo Māori, and all these Māoris are roaring with laughter, and he just has to go, oh, I'm sorry, Parky, has I can't translate that. <laughs> Uh, and it, but and and it's it's and I it's important in the sense that he wasn't he wasn't kind of trying to it was it's it, it hit in two ways he's saying look you don't understand Maori so you didn't get the joke in the first instance but also I can't translate that to you because you'll probably find it very vulgar mm. and it's almost trying to say like you know so, like th- this is th- this just has unfortunately this just has to be an inside joke between me and all the Maoris in this room and you could argue it's exclusionary but actually it's kind of saying like you don't you don't actually need to be part of this to mm. still enjoy my music because usually after these jokes he'd he'd you know he'd kind of make it up to them by being like anyway here's this song by Chuck Berry and and so it was this um yeah I so I I'm, I'm always interested in the way in which like not just not just the song itself, but the way in which the artist kind of interacts with his audience. And Prince Tui Tik is a perfect example of how a Māori was interacting with like a multi kind of cultural audience, but was still kind of saying, it's a show for Māori, but you're more than welcome to come in and enjoy it. Um, and so really that was what Māori spirit was. It's kind of these like, and I think you can see that in like, um, Af- like African American music is one of that as well. Like there are going to be um, instances and in jokes that, white people even if it's in the same language are going to completely miss mm. um but you know african americans are going to be like i got I, I it get that. Yeah. yeah and the the you know the european american audience is like what 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 like why are you guys laughing what was so funny it's not to say oh you you could never understand it's just saying look at <laughs> yeah you can, like you, you're gonna have a fun time at this concert but this was just a little bit of a you know yeah. a, a moment for us and, and now we can move on so yeah looking at that yeah, but I was trying to get really important that, like, you know, it's not to say that Europeans can't identify with that Māori spirit. It was just to say that, like, you you required to enter our world mm-hmm. for a small moment to understand what was being said, rather than us entering your world. And that was kind of the importance about talking about um, uh, contemporary Māori music is that it's not Māori kind of trying to fit in with jazz they're bringing jazz to fit in with their cultural expression. Yeah. 
So a, I could have just said that, really. <laughs> <laughs> the longer answer was much more interesting. I mean, yes, so. yes. <laughs> But yeah, no, we'll he'll see. cut this down. It's fine. I probably won't. I probably won't actually. Uh, I'll probably mostly keep it the same. <laughs> oh god, because uh, this is this is very interesting. I don't know about everyone else, but I'm actually finding this this is very very interesting for me because um, as we kind of said, and that's it, a major compliment because I've been here with him for at least four hours. <laughs> yes, but it's it's, it's interesting to get a perspective um, that for me it's very my perspective is very academic um coming from the outside reading the books and mine's like a fusion academic plus also like what my aunties told me when i was saying i was writing the dissertation exactly <laughs> so that's it. it it's cool to get that kind yeah. of different perspective yeah. of someone who's um in, in the kind of different mindset and a different it comes at it kind of in a slightly different way than i do the opposite direction i suppose the, the opposite yeah. Di- yeah, yeah i guess yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you want to put it that way yeah um i guess we've kind of already talked we talked a little bit about stan walker and, and oh yeah those guys um but yeah i guess like kind of what's the uh what's the difference between say stan walker and the Ma- uh, modern marty quartet versus i don't know fucking taylor swift or whatever right <laughs> here right. i've written versus random other pop songs uh, yeah i think apart from like so the way in which they're producing their music and the the way in which their music sounds is really not much difference i mean they are still pop songs the modern marty quartet slightly different because they're cultural references the Sir Howard Morrison quartet mm. and that has a history in Māori show bands um yeah which... we'll get that in, the, in a minute <laughs> Māori, yeah. um so that so that's a complete that's a that's a little bit of a different history but the the difference is is that um well I suppose it's not so much a difference actually I mean Taylor Swift approaches music in the same from her cultural context um she was really a country singer and then she kind of you know, as she as she kind of became more in, engrossed in Hollywood, she, her kind of music started to change and develop. Very normal. Um, so she's just kind of singing from her cultural perspective. In the same way that Gaga does a lot of music that would be... I mean, she did an entire album with um, Tony Bennett, um, and that was a jazz album uh, coming from New York. A lot of her music is a cultural reference to kind of that New York uh, ca- club scene. Um, so... Essentially, with Stan Walker and the Modern Māori Quartet, they're just approaching music from their cultural perspective. Um, Stan Walker is an urban Māori, uh, he, 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 but he has strong roots to his um, traditional rohe, or his traditional areas. Um, he knows his iwi, he knows uh, you know, his tūpuna, he knows his, his history and, and where his tūranga waiwai is, or his place to stand. Um, but he is also, he grew up, he, he lived in Australia. He won Australian Idol. He did. Take, take that. Um, and <laughs> is he, that really a big, <laughs> it's Australia. I mean, you, you know, I, I like, I, the thing is, is that a no, like no, like, you know, we just love it when we beat Australia and we, really and, we and we, and we, we beat Australia in their own show <laughs> and it felt we, really we good. We went on their turf. And we went on their turf and we, and we stole the trophy and honestly, after taking fire lap, that's the least they could do. Um, so, but like, you know, so he, he has this kind of, a lot of the music that he makes is he, he uses his kind of urban Maori and, and his, and his Maori tanga to express his music and the the biggest way in which you can tell oh is this is this music resonating with maori is to ask maori and say are you listening to stan walker and if you talk to any maori person about stan walker even if they haven't listened to his music for two years they'll talk about how much they love stan walker they'll talk about how much how cool stan walker is because he's stan the man um (laughs) you know like and it's and it's really because a lot of young maori would probably see themselves in him um, when they hear him talk, they hear someone like him. Mm. They hear their accent. They hear his, you know, like his, you know, his boost. <laughs> um, you know, that he like it's kind. They they hear they hear themselves in him. And with the modern Māori quartet, I think again, it's the same cultural references, but and they speak like us and they and they talk like us. But uh, um, but what's important with them is that a lot of the music they're singing is old Māori music, and. God, I really wish I could go into like um world like the music for World War Two and World War One in New Zealand. We're gonna get to that. Yeah, in a yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll wait for that question. But you know, they're they're using a lot of music from like um World War from the World War Two from the Māori Battalion, um, 
uh, music that stuck around, and then they use and they and they're performing in a way that's familiar to Maori because it goes back to those Maori show bands, which I also have been told we're going to um, enter. So we'll we'll wait for that to come. But yeah, I think it's just it's it's talking it's music from the Maori cultural perspective, and again, a lot of music anyway is done that way, as I used with Taylor Swift and Lady Gaga, mm. um, Cardi B, for example. I mean, you know, say what you want about Cardi B's music. But, her, uh, you know, I like it like that. She's a Caribbean woman that grew up in New York and she sampled a song by a Caribbean man who lived in New York. And a lot of it is, you know, kind of talking about how she wants, like, diamonds and, and pearls and she wants to live this fabulous lifestyle, which is just, you know, the cultural background for why a lot of people immigrated to the United States in the first place. Mm. Um, you know, the the kind of the land of milk and honey or... The, you know, the, 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 the streets of New York are paved with gold. Mm. You know, this kind of, you know, people moved to America to make something of themselves. And so a lot of music from, say, like, um, like Cardi B, um, even to the, to the extent of, like, um, Selena, for example, it's all about, you know, making something of yourself in this big new country and, and being number one. So, again, it's all just from your cultural perspective. Mm. Cool. Um, so before we move, before we talk about the the kind of the, the show bands kind of stuff, yes, um, you did make a little bit of a thing that I'm, I'm going to chuck in here. I was going to talk about it later, but we'll chuck in here instead. Um, a bit of a tangent, but do you want to speak a little bit to the difference between uh, urban and non-urban Maori? Because yeah. that the, the that distinction is is not necessarily just whether you live on a farm or you live no. in an apartment. No, uh, at, at least for for Maori, it's not. No, for for. for parking car that's basically it yeah <laughs> but yeah. but there is th- th- that is kind of a big thing yes it will become a big thing as as kind of um at least in, in our chronological story as the cities start to come up yeah. new zealand starts to urbanize and and that's a problem for for maori for, for many yeah. different reasons so do you yeah just want to talk a little bit about kind yeah of so so recognizing that this will be an episode at some point um it will just give a little brief just a bit of context bit of context yeah. um so yes yeah, so it's more than just saying are you a maori that lives on a on a farm and are you a maori that lives in central auckland uh central wellington and tiaro um the the distinction is so i for example grew up in auckland uh the largest urban center in the country um and i would be considered a rural maori and i'd be considered a rural maori because i often went back to my original uh rohe or land which is up in um mangonui in um Muri Whenua, which is the far north, because we're very creative at naming places here in New Zealand. And um, so I so I went up there almost every holiday, every Easter, every Labour weekend. We always go up there for Christmas. I'll probably go up there again for Christmas. Um, so we always so I always go up there. So I know my kind of my co- like I know where I'm meant to stand. So I know my Maunga, I know my Awa, I know my Moana, I know my Tupuna, I know my genealogy. Um, that is what we would call a rural Māori. An urban Māori is someone who, whose entire, who, who is Māori, but doesn't know or has lost or, um, isn't aware of their kind of their cultural connection. So where they were actually from. Um, now this is so, and I need to preface that there are obviously iwi whose natural lands are in urban centers. So there are about 19 iwi in Auckland, for example. Um, obviously their little hair is in Auckland. So therefore that's their traditional land. So if they, again, if they live in West Haven, their natural, like, uh, which is in central Auckland, uh, their natural law here is West Haven. And they know that, and they know the awa, and they know all the history around it. That doesn't make them urban. That makes them, you know, whatever iwi they are, naitaiki, tamaki, or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, the, the difference is, is like, uh, how how really you group yourself. So if you're a rural Māori, you know your iwi, your hapu, your whānau, your area. If you're urban Māori, you probably, and this isn't universal, but you, and you don't know where you're originally from, you may actually kind of coalesce with other Māori that don't know. Um, so there are in Auckland urban Māori authorities. Um, and these are basically groups of Māori that uh, don't have access to their original little here or the original lands and have kind of coalesced around each other and built communities within um these urban centers and that was mainly because until about the 1940s 50s um the divide was maori lived in rural areas and pakia lived in the cities um and then as the 
kind of the years rolled on after World War Two, Māori started moving to the cities, um, and the cities became kind of very big and multicultural. Um, and a lot of the Māori that were left in the rural areas were kind of your gra- like my say for example my parents parents and grandparents and uh sometimes they never moved back and so eventually the kind of the old homesteads and stuff that were out in rural areas would kind of fall into disrepair um you may kind of lose the title deeds uh eventually kind of marae and these kinds of new iwi organizations would assemble and they'd kind of start to coalesce and collectivize the land and um so you you, it's almost like you'd miss out but you'd also forget and then not be able to kind of claim your place um so that's the distinction it's not it's not about where you live it's more about like where you feel like where you feel your kind of sense of being maori is and if you're urban maori you're just as maori as everybody else um i want to make that distinction (laughs) i'm not better because i know my iwi um it's just that urban maori don't know what it is and may have may not have the capacity to ever know where that is but they still are maori and they still want to practice tikanga and they still want to be maori obviously and so they've kind of created their own if anything it's more very natural they've created a hapu based not on um whakapapa but more on kind of shared experience is how i would how i would describe it yeah so that's going to be a bit of a thing as we go forward as well um sort of talking about it. what we'll find is that uh, obviously marae are generally quite rural they tend to be out in the you know in the, out, in the, in the sticks in the sticks <laughs> um and when urban marae start showing up yeah. that is actually a reasonably big thing it doesn't sound that big it seems it sounds quite natural you know maori come into the cities and so they want to put yeah. a marae but it, it, as we'll find as the story goes on that's actually a pretty big kind of cultural shift i guess in a well sense. yeah and also uh in auckland i just want to give a shout out to one of the like kind of the oldest and probably biggest urban marae which is a marae called hawani waititi um out in west auckland and that marae was founded by um urban Māori that wanted a you know a place in Auckland to kind of um culturally express themselves and these places have kind of become institutions in and of themselves um and actually have produced some pretty some, like sometimes the apex of, of Māori cultural expression um one group Natu Manako which is the Kapahaka group that won last uh last year's Te Matatini, um they actually all come from Hawani Waititi and practice a Hawani Waititi marae so it's just kind of just wanting to kind of put it out there that just because it's an urban marae doesn't mean it's less mm. Maori cultural specific if anything sometimes they're a bit more Maori cultural centric than right. rural marae it uh, can yeah, be yeah. sometimes yeah absolutely um as well as that I will add as well um if any of the stuff that James is talking about are in terms of the stuff about like uh iwi hapu whanau uh whakapapa or rohe we covered all of that back in the social structure episode so you can go back to those the one that i actually listened to which is why i didn't elaborate because <laughs> i knew we had already covered it he knew we covered that <laughs> yeah so yeah no so if you are c- confused by any of those uh go to the website you can find those um a- as well uh, all those terms and stuff and that sort of thing if, if any of that is confusing This is where we will leave it for this episode, with the tantalising prospect of discussing the era of Māori show bands. We will be back next time to discuss that and other topics like World War II songs and kapahaka. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A O T E A. R O A. This podcast is a one man band. If you enjoy listening to me talk history, you can support us through Patreon, buy merch, or give us a review. It means a lot and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, Hairi Tu Watu, Hoki Tu Mai. See you next time. <laughs>